Welcome back to Sunday Vibes 1 and all. We're still not back in the pub. We're still in self-isolation, but we are here to answer your burning questions. As ever, Patrick Van Straten and Christopher Hamill are joining me. Let's get straight into it then. The first one was sent in by Alvin Katang. He says, with Team of the Year coming up, who have been the most disappointing players this season? Now, I think this is quite a difficult one because... People's definitions of disappointing will vary. But let's go through then. Position by position, do a full 11. What do we reckon, boys? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. All right, okay. Goalkeeper. Is anybody going to beat Kepa to this one, Pat? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Like, there's nobody who can. There's nobody who has the level of expectation that he has and has been as poor as he has. He's been arguably the worst goalkeeper in the league, with the exception of that pubber who played for West Ham for about 10 minutes. Um, Roberto, Roberto. Yeah. Kepa was brought in. Respect on his name. <laughs> Kepa was brought in because he was meant to be good with his feet, and he's okay with his feet, but he's nothing special. He's not like pinging passes like Edison or Allison. And not only is he not a good shot stopper, but he's actually considerably below average. I mean, I think he's played in all but two games for them this season. Um, but I think by XG, they've allowed eleven goals more. Uh, than they than they should have something like that it's just absolutely ridiculous and every now and then he'll produce a world class save but I feel like every keeper in the world will every now and then produce a world class save the worry are the easy stops that he just seems absolutely incapable of making and I don't think his defenders trust him like they, they I agree with the, that the one thing you, that you could say is he's not disappointing in the sense that this is basically what he has been his whole career. He wasn't much better than this in Spain. He, his numbers were not dissimilar to this. They're worse now, but they weren't good in Spain. Um, but when you're attracting a world-class price tag, people expect you to be at minimum very, very good. And not only has he not been very, very good, he's been among the league's worst. Um, to, to me, this is just such an easy spot for Chelsea to upgrade in the summer. Um, I don't, I don't really, really see much yeah. competition. But it's, I think it's a really difficult spot to upgrade because he signed a seven-year contract. He's going to be so hard to shift. It, it, like, you're going to have to take a £50 million loss before you even sign another goalkeeper. That doesn't make him hard to shift. That just makes him embarrassing to shift. Like, the thing that might make him hard to shift is wages. I don't know what his wages are, but if you're going for 70 mil, they're probably pretty hefty. Um, but I don't think it'd be a problem for, the, for them to move him on. Like, they can probably send him back to Spain on a loan with an option to buy or something. But... It's, it's more embarrassing that they're going to have to, yeah, take a £50 million hit. But that doesn't really, you know, what, it, what are you going to do? Just persist with him for another year and have him sandbag your Champions League campaign because you don't want to be embarrassed. It's not going to help. You can't. You can't. He's conceding 1.4 goals per 90. <laughs> Chelsea are only conceding 8.7 shots, I think, in the league per 90. And they've conceded a whopping 49 goals in 35 games. At least that rang true prior to the Norwich game. Um, yeah, seven clean sheets in 31 games. Uh, and he only has a save percentage of 57%. Like Pat said, he's going to tank your Champions League ambitions. And the margins are extremely fine up there. Uh, just for the sakes of variety, we could throw Jordan Pickford in there as a candidate. Um, because the 26-year-old's not really fared much better this season, has he? Not missed a game. Um since signing from Sunderland for £30 million in 2017. So he's consistently inconsistent, <laughs> if nothing else. Ranks 11th in the league for clean sheets with eight, so marginally better than Kepa. Maybe that's what saves him here in our, in our infamous lineup. Um, and again, Everton, not, not overly porous like Chelsea, but they concede high quality chances or at least allow average chances to hit the back of the net. I mean, they're only conceding 11.2 shots a game, which is the seventh best in the division. Um, but they've conceded 52 goals. And they've already conceded six more goals than this time last year with three games to go. And every time I watch Everton, which, you know, the games have come thick and fast recently, haven't they? He has just been woeful from corners, from set pieces. Um, I've never seen a goalkeeper attempt to pick up the ball uh, like he does, at least in, in the in the top divisions and his place is becoming untenable in that side Ancelotti's clearly not a fan uh, and I think they will move for a goalkeeper this season uh, in the All summer right. coming so Pickford's a, a, maybe an outside shout but I think should we all agree Kepa as, a, as the goalkeeper in this XI I'm happy with that alright okay 
Yeah, we'll have Pickers on the bench. Let's move on to the defence then. Um, starting a right back. I want to throw uh, João Cancelo in there. Sadly enough, because it feels like a player that we kind of hyped up and maybe missed the boat on. Maybe it just hasn't happened for him at Manchester City. Obviously, it did cost a lot of money, didn't it? I think £60 million was his fee. Although Danilo went the other way, didn't it? So it kind of offset it somewhat. And I just feel like every time I've watched Cancelo this season, he's been a clear downgrade on Carl Walker. Um, and this is a Carl Walker, I think maybe 12 months ago, we were thinking could be upgraded. At Manchester City so fair play to him for stepping up you know no goal contributions in 1920 which is something that will be really disappointing for him given he put up quite a lot um, in in uh, where was he in Italy uh, before right at Juventus I think he was about four <laughs> yeah, goal contributions in 1819 um, I don't know. I just feel like he'll probably be moved on, to be honest with you, by Pep Guardiola this summer. I'm not too sure whether or not they'll they'll want to keep hold of him, which yeah. feels like a shame because he inevitably is going to go somewhere else and be a fairly decent player, I think. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you're right in the sense that what he was brought in for, he's not necessarily excelled at, right? Uh, but it, I think when he has played, his underlying numbers have been solid. So almost five tackles and interceptions, one shot, 1.2 key passes, two dribbles. Um, so he's still a, an attacking threat. It's just not a mounted, you know, in, in end product. Um, he's also, I think, averaging over seven deep progressions, seven passes into the final third per night. So this is a, a decent return. Um, but yeah, Kai Walker perhaps has benefited from the competition, upped his game. And I'd say it's worth keeping Cancelo around just to see if he can, if he can build on this underwhelming sort of progress there's no doubt we were expecting more um but there's also a suggestion pat that he could improve yeah i mean i don't know if they would let him go this summer unless they can kind of use him in another important deal because i agree with chris i think when he's been on the pitch he's been good and and actually i think that City signed him on the understanding that they were going to be fairly similar to last season, this season. And I think that losing Fernandinho from the centre of midfield, which I'm sure we'll come on to later, mm. made them a lot more vulnerable than they expected. And as a result, they went for the solid, more conservative, more defensively minded uh, fullback in Kyle Walker. Kyle Walker is a lot more reliable in that regard. Whereas Cancelo, though he has good tackle and interception numbers, that's kind of because he's roaming forward and pressing. Um... I think that maybe if they shore up central defence, uh, Rodri ha has had that year to settle, then next year you might see the best of Cancelo. But um, mm. I don't know. To, to me, it's not his fault, the price tag. And to be honest, when he's on the pitch, like we say, he, he's, he's been OK. Um, but I suppose... Yeah, I don't think he's been bad. He hasn't been bad, has he? He's just not lived up to the heights that maybe we set him. Like, I think there's worse right-backs in the league. You could maybe say Serge Aurier in this category has been disappointing, given that I think he's had a really bad season. But, but yeah, much I just, lower level. We didn't ever hype Aurier, did we? Yeah. we? We never hyped Aurier up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just difficult, though, because like Cancelo, when he's on the field, does kind of look like the player we thought he was going to be. Um, and I think the reason he hasn't been on the field is largely largely attributable to other issues going on at Man City. But 60 mil, same same principle as Kepa, really. Same principle as I'm sure we'll discuss later, Nicola Pepe. Like when you'll get when somebody pays that much for you, a lot is expected, and he hasn't really delivered it. What is it? A thousand minutes in the league? It's not mm. that impressive. Just to give some of those stats that I mentioned earlier a bit of context, because. We have got his numbers from Juventus. I mean, he's averaging roughly the same amount of deep progressions and more passes into the final third. So he's actually deadlier to an extent. Obviously, it's, it's not panned out that way um, when he's playing for City. So hopefully this this will, you know, soon start converting into into solid goal and assist numbers. But, um, but yeah, I'd, I'd keep him around. Do you think Hector Bellerin or Ben Davies are worth talking about in terms of actual performance to expectation um i think well, hector bear and you've got to put his injury record up there as well haven't you so i think he's been a little bit unlucky with that yeah he's sat out about half two i think he's got about 1100 mm. minutes now and obviously then when you come back from a cruciate injury nobody really expects you to come back at, at yeah. full speed the, the weird thing i find though with, with bearing is that Every time he has a kind of mediocre performance, Arsenal fans will say, oh, he's lost a step. You know, like his athleticism is really down. Whereas actually, after a slow return, I think now his athleticism looks fine. And I think actually it's been um, 
you know, some positional mistakes and some passing errors that have been a bigger problem for him late, lately. But I, d I don't really worry about him. I don't really think it's that disappointing a campaign because his numbers are pretty much what they were before. Like, he's doing less creative work, but I think that's because uh, Arsenal are playing with a different system and they've played under three different managers and they haven't been very good. Um, so, I don't, I don't know. I mean, he hasn't particularly disappointed me, I guess. Uh, and similarly, Ben Davis, I mean... Ben Davis has also been injured a lot, right? He's he's been out in and out of the side a lot. And again, I just think like Spurs have got worse across the board. But we do need a left back. Uh, what about Benjamin Mendy? I, I know another player that's been fairly blighted with injuries, but I feel like it's a position that um, Man City will probably upgrade this summer, especially with the chat with David Alaba coming in. And it's kind of a player that never hit the heights we thought he was going to hit after joining from Monaco, even though he kind of had six good months and then got injured. So maybe I'm being a bit harsh there, but I don't feel like Benjamin Mendy has, maybe it's not just this season, but as a Manchester City player, has slightly disappointed given we're expected more. Yeah, I mean, shades of Bella in there, right? In that they mm. didn't come back. He didn't come back from injury, the same player, and it took him a while to, to rediscover his form. And then he had sort of a series of minor setbacks, which, which prevented him getting a good run out. And I think we are seeing that at the end of the season. He has been quite potent going forward, Mendy. Um, still making odd decisions at times. Still doesn't like a £50 million pound, you know, uh, fullback in, in, in sort of his array of, of passing uh, on occasion. Uh, you know, minus that lovely sort of drilled ball he's got from the byline. Um, but, but maybe Ben Davies, just because of, I, I suppose, um, I mean, most of his numbers are down, I, I guess. Um, and Spurs, I think, collectively, apart from maybe Chelsea, defensive as a defensive unit, have, have underwhelmed the most. I don't know if you guys agree with that. I think what I will say is, I think there's a more disappointing player that could play in the left back slot from Spurs. I think maybe we should put Jan Vertonghen in at left back to allow us more areas in centre backs to talk about disappointments because I think Jan Vertonghen has had a honking season. Um, what is he, 33 now, I think? He's just fallen off a cliff in terms of what he can offer to this Tottenham Hotspur squad. And Jose has brought him on at times at left back. So I'm going to put Jan Vertonghen's name forward as the left back option here because I think he has had his worst ever season yeah. in the Premier League. It would, and it would I feel don't a bit think harsh, he'll be here next season. Because he's only played at left back five times. But when he has played there, yeah, it's, I mean, Spurs haven't looked great. Uh, I'm, happy, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go with you guys on this. I'm putting him forward as a defender, but just because we've got a slot of may maybe available in left back, I think he has he has the ability to fill that with his disappointment. <laughs> he's just old as <laughs> though. Like he's just so old. Like I, I don't know, man. Like it's so sad to get to like 32, 33, be on the downslope, and then a manager comes in and he says, "Not only are you getting slower, but we're going to move you from centre back to left back." Like that is a rep that is a, a recipe for looking like a tit, and that's kind of what's happened to Vertonghen this year. I feel a bit. I feel a bit bad for him, but like he hasn't had, he hasn't been good. No. So we're going to go Yao Cancelo and Jan as our as our fullbacks. Sure. Yeah. I mean, right. okay, Vatong enough. That that feels harsh, but we'll roll okay. With so it. who do you want to put a left back? Who do you want to put a left back over? I mean, I think um, Ben Davies as an actual left back. Um, I mean, for his tackles, and interceptions to go down, for his shots to go down, for his key passes uh, and, and dribbles to sort of be stagnant uh, and his pass percentage to drop from 86% to 77% qualifies him for this position. It's just not a lot of people care about him. He's just a little bit vanilla, isn't he? So, I mean, Vertonghen will probably get get the vote in the comments. Um, but Ben Davies under the hood probably qualifies it, you know, for it as well. So let's let's just go with one or the other. I'll go Ben Davies, you go Vertong. Right, let's move on to centre-backs though, because we're just getting a bit stuck in that left-back role. Uh, has anybody got any centre-halves they want to throw forward immediately? Yeah, David Luiz. Mm, yeah, of course, man. Totally forgot about David Luiz. <laughs> like, I mean, Arsenal spent money for him kind of knowing it was a bit of a risk. Um, and to be honest, apparently he has been a very good influence in the dressing room. Um, like everybody used to talk about that at Chelsea and now everybody's talking about it at Arsenal. So I suppose there must be something to that. Um, but really at his age when you're spending money you needed him to be good this season and I think he has been better in a back three I do um I also thought the goal against Spurs when everyone said it was David Luiz's fault I thought that was fa fairly clearly Kolasinac's fault but um but he's given away penalties this season he just constantly makes mistakes he's and going he's... for the record isn't he isn't he on four 
something like that. And his passing out from the back has just... its a, a, In some games, it's been incredibly useful, but overall, it hasn't added enough to make up for... It's kind of like Kepper in that sense. It hasn't added enough to make up for his lack of quality in the fundamentals. Um, on the other hand, if it was a choice between keeping him... Uh, and keeping Socrates, I'd definitely keep David Luiz because there's at least some upside with David Luiz, which I don't think there is with Socrates. Mm. Uh, another candidate I think is worth a shout is John Stones. Yeah. I think John Stones, um, a lot of people, and I'm sure John Stones himself will feel like he's had a really underwhelming season given that with the Laporte injury, it was kind of there for one of the other centre-backs to step up and go, you know what? Despite the fact we've lost America, I'm going to step up and be the man at the heart of this defence. Now, now Vin Vinny Kay's gone as well. And I just feel like he's gone backwards in the last um, 12 months. I feel like if the right offer came in for John Stones, Man City would be very open to, to listening to it. Yeah, I mean, I, that one hurts sort of ac across the board, doesn't it? Uh, with fans across the board, because he was supposed to be England's next big thing as well. And I think a, a lot of people had expectations for him to... to, to be in the heart of that defence with Harry Maguire for the next five or six years. Um, but the fact, you know, Pep doesn't trust him, trust him and is sort of throwing him on in the last 10 minutes of games uh, isn't a, a massive vote of confidence for his, yeah, for his future as a starting centre-half for City. Just so we don't get accused of talking about all the big boys, um, I'm going to throw Issa Diop in there just because from West Ham of course just because I had really high expectations of him after the season he had last year um, and the 23 year old not really been at it this campaign has he so 29 Premier League appearances 4 goal contributions which is fine but a bit beside the point for a centre half uh, and his 19-20 stats 2.5 tackles and interceptions down from 4 uh, his success rate has sort of gone from late 70s um, to, to sort of late 60s uh, his passing has dropped, which you kind of do expect, I suppose, in a David Moyes side. I imagine that they're clearing it rather than trying to be progressive with, with the ball. And West Ham have conceded a whopping 59 goals in 35 games, uh, which is the fourth worst in the division. And he, sadly, is a part of that. I mean, I, I thought he was someone that, you know, top six, top eight, eight sides, it'd be worth him looking at um, last campaign. But he, his, his stock has taken a bit of a hit. So I would I would gladly include him, but that's just from a personal perspective, really. Yeah, I think in the same in the same um, sort of way. If we're not just talking about the top six, I think Tyrone Mings has potentially had a bit of a disappointing season, maybe by his own standards as well. Um, I mean, I think the the goal against Man United highlighted it really really well. You know, kind of gives the ball away on the halfway line, doesn't pressurise. Greenwood very well either. Uh, I think Dean Smith came out after and, and said it was uh, not good defending by Tyrone Mings. And I think overall, Villa fans will probably be a little bit disappointed with his output this season. I think there are some other candidates, you know, Chelsea, Pato, Andreas Christensen maybe. Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe though. Tony Rudiger. Yeah, though again, Rudiger like not really fit most of the time. Uh, I don't know, maybe Christensen, maybe. But I think we've always kind of said Christensen's better in a back three, so... I'm not that surprised. And also Chelsea's Chelsea's midfield without Conte has had some some seriously kind of ropey moments. I think there, mm. there was a large portion of the season where you could just waltz through the centre of the park against Chelsea. Um, and that made life a little bit difficult for them. Um, I'm actually finding it hard to think of other candidates here, though, just because it's such a it's such a team exercise defending. And I, yeah. and I always find it hard to just blame individual players. You know, the same with Tyrone Mings. Like, Tyrone Mings at the beginning of the season, I was getting a lot of shit from Villa fans because I said that I didn't think he was that great. And I, I don't think he's that great. But I think he's only a disappointment. Well, he's a disappointment based on how much they paid for him. But he's partially a disappointment because Villa fans convinced themselves he was amazing. Like, he's a perfectly fine like Premier League centre-back. He's a Premier League quality centre-back. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and they and conceded it, 65 goals. It's like, yeah, then Villa have just been all over the shop all season long. So, mm. I mean, what can you do there? They're a historically bad defensive side. Um, I, I don't know. I feel I feel a bit sorry for those guys who get stuck like trying to stem the tide at the back of these relegation teams. You know, like you look at Bournemouth. Can you imagine how, how unrewarding it is to be a centre-back for Bournemouth? 
Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're Mepham and you're seeing Brentford, you know, come up this year and Bournemouth potentially go down and he's only like 22, 23 and he had a really high potential, uh, had his injury woes and he's, he's not played over a thousand minutes. So, and he was one of the big money, money signings as well. So I'm sure he, he's pretty disappointed with his own campaign. Yeah, by the same sort of regards, you could look at some of that Norwich back four, you know, Ben Godfrey, very highly rated, Jamal Lewis, Max Ahrens. I don't think any of them have had good seasons. Mm. Um, I think that their stock has potentially taken a bit of a hit. So you could say that's disappointing. So it is all down to kind of definition of disappointment, isn't it? All right, let's move on to the midfield then. Most obvious place to start, Tango and Dombele. Who wants to take Tango and Dombele here? Woof. Well, we were talking off camera about his performance against Bournemouth, weren't we? And I didn't oh. actually watch that game in any great detail. So can you can you tell me a little bit more? Because is it starting to feel like Jose's stance on him is justified or is it Jose's fault that he's, he's in this sort of vein of form and, you know, headspace and, and fitness? It just feels such a weird um, scenario, doesn't it, for us to be talking about how T Tango and Dombele has been a disappointment given when we, w when he joined Tottenham, we said he'd be one of the signings of the season. Uh, he's still only 23 as well, and it kind of felt like watching against Bournemouth, a player who uh, isn't favoured by the management, is kind of thrown in at the deep end uh, at about 40% fitness um, and didn't really understand his role within the Tottenham team on the night. And I, I feel a bit sorry for him, to be totally honest. I think he'll probably get a move this summer away from Tottenham Hotspur. I don't think Jose is going to persevere with this one. Um, and whoever picks him up, I wish him the best of luck because I think they are still getting a talented player. But you can't deny this season has been a disappointment for the player, for the club mm -hmm. and for us as well because we really hyped him up. We did. We also hyped up Lacelso as well. So at least he's come good. But... Yeah, it's not that Tangai and Dombele is not a good player, is it, Pat? And, and Man, he's the joint highest earner at Tottenham. Yeah. Let's not forget about that. It's like big money at Tottenham. And he's being linked, obviously, with Barcelona, because why wouldn't Barcelona just go out and spunk more money on a central midfielder? Um, because, hmm. yeah, yeah, their transfer business makes no sense. But, Pat, do you see any future for him at Tottenham? Uh, it doesn't look that way with Mourinho there. But on the other hand, if I was Spurs and I had the choice between Mourinho and Undombele, I'd certainly go for Undombele. Um Spicy, I like it. He's barely, well, is it really? Like, I mean, Mourinho, already, everybody already hates him. Like, he's he's done a horrible job since being there. He's, but he's on absolute P, isn't he? And he's got about three years left on his contract. So I can't see him going anywhere. And, and then Don Belli's probably not lost a lot of his value and, and could be sold on. And, and you know, they could just plaster that, that wound, I guess. Yeah, but one of those guys is more likely to add value to your club in the long term. And also, I'm pretty... I'm pr I'm pretty certain that Daniel Levy, given given Mourinho's history with contracts, like I'm pretty certain Daniel Levy has probably got season breaks um, in the in that contract, so they wouldn't have to pay out the remainder of it. Uh, because it's not like there are loads of people clamouring for Mourinho's signature at this stage of his career. I'm pretty certain that Spurs were probably able to make a deal that that wouldn't be too costly to them if they did have to get rid of him mm. at some stage. But if you're not if you're not going to play him, like move him on. Like there, there was there's a rumor that Barcelona would be willing to exchange some players for him. And if you were Spurs, you might say, well, if we could get you know Nelson Semedo and a centre back, you know, or, or Usman Dembele or something out of this deal, then maybe we'd go for it. But when you've got a player like Ndombele who's been injured most of the season, has been good when he's played with a couple of exceptions. Well, not that he's been fully fit, and you know Harry Kane's been terrible most of the time that he's played. Um, and, and yet you see teams like Barcelona and Bayern Munich are interested and think he can upgrade their midfields. I, I would probably think maybe we should keep this guy and at least give him another season. Um, if the relationship's broken down, then I guess you've got something's got to give. And at this stage, it's probably going to be Undombele. But um, he was probably hoping Arsenal would batter Spurs at the weekend so that Mourinho might get sacked sooner rather than later. Yeah, we're just yeah. we're just not seeing the same end on ballet that we saw at, at, at Leon, are we? Just not on the bit ball anywhere near as much. I think his passes have almost halved from 60 or 58 to 30. Uh, he's still a pretty useful dribbler. They're actually up from 3.4, but maybe because you know <laughs> the harmony in the team isn't isn't on point, and he doesn't know where to go with the ball, uh, so he's trying to do too much work himself. Uh, his key passes are down. Um, so, you know, all the obvious metrics point towards a player who is really suffering. Um, and it's not just suffering in a system now. It appears to be like physically suffering because he just doesn't look 
fit, does he? Or uh, uh, up to speed. Um, so, are we playing a 4-3-3, by the way, in our most disappointing side? I think so, yeah. So, should I we put so. him at the heart of midfield, then? Yeah, okay. I think there's a couple of other candidates um, in midfield as well. Um, I want to point to Arsenal straight away. I think maybe Meza Ozil. Would we classify this as a disappointing season, or are we just saying this is now commonplace for him not to play any, any games and sit there on a 300k a week contract? Um... It's interesting, isn't it? Because it feels like he's been he's been out of favour under different managers mm. for different reasons. Um, like he did play at the beginning un, under under Arteta, but it seems like now Arteta wants to kind of move away, and especially now he's gone to the three four three. Yeah, it doesn't seem like Urzel really fits in there. Obviously, there was a personality issue um, as well as a team balance issue under Emery. But yeah, I mean, I think a goal and two assists in the league. I mean, he still creates way more chances than anybody else in the Arsenal squad when he plays. Um, but it's certainly not been a good season. And you it's unusual for this sort of player to age this badly. So somebody may still well get a couple of good years of him when he mm. eventually moves on. But I don't know if it's salvageable at Arsenal at this point. I just think that Arteta wants a more mobile uh, attacking midfielder. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And uh, maybe... Genduzi Pato? I I just feel like Genduzi was supposed to be the next big thing in that Arsenal midfield. And maybe that's the reason I'm saying Genduzi. I don't think he's actually had a horrendous season or a bad season. But just because I thought he was going to go on to become something really special and now is struggling to get in the squad, I feel like he will probably see this season as a disappointment towards the back end. Yeah, I mean, I guess with Genduzi it's difficult because Genduzi's not being left out for quality reasons. He's being left out because he's apparently a bit of a dick but um yeah i don't know like his numbers are still are still very good actually and also he's 21 like he's 21 i think that because he's been there a couple of seasons you get a lot of people saying well he should be taking games by the scruff of the neck now they're actually he did do that when we beat villa with 10 men and he did do that when we came from behind to draw with spurs at home but um yeah i mean i definitely think it will be a disappointing campaign for him but i also think He's twenty one. Like it doesn't yeah. it doesn't bother me that much. Um Yeah. Do we put him in the side over someone put, like Jorginho as well? I'd put Rodri in over over most people. Rodri in over Jorginho? Mm, I oh, I don't know. I think Jorginho's been hamstrung a little bit by playing in a system that doesn't really fit him. He's not particularly mobile. Um Did you see the other day when Chelsea went to a four two four when they were chasing the game against I think it might have been Sheffield United when Hudson Adoy came on? And the look on the look on Jorginho's face as they went to a four-two-four, like like he could survive with just one person next to him. He just looked he just looked bereft. Yeah, if if you've got like Peak and Golo Kante next to him, then that might work. But Kante's not Peak and Golo Kante doesn't really exist anymore, probably. Um, and he's not as good as Kovacic. Kovacic has been probably. Yeah maybe Chelsea's best player this season and it hasn't helped as well that while Jorginho is still clearly a much better player than Billy Gilmore um Billy Gilmore's had some impressive performances and as a result Chelsea fans are like we should be giving those minutes to Gilmore and you know it's he's kind of ended up becoming the guy who he's the fall guy for that particular desire to get a young player on the pitch but but Rodri to me has been a clear downgrade on a 33 year old Fernandinho in the center of the park and but Fernandinho, even at 33, is arguably the best defensive midfielder in the league behind Fabinho. But what? Well, what? Well, and Kante. I'd say ahead of Fabinho. But um, uh, I don't know. Yes, that's definitely. Fernandinho was amazing last season, and City were better across the board. But Rodri is an extremely physically gifted, you know, excellent passer who they spent an awful lot of money on to come in and immediately anchor that midfield and his numbers are worse than Fernandinho's in pretty much every regard um but it's not so much that as it's just how much more porous they look with him in there like when you you can look at his numbers and they're and they're important but it's more that when you watch Man City you know some of the games in the autumn particularly I think of that Wolves game they just looked like they were out of position all the time and it's because Rodri's nose for danger is just not as sophisticated as Fernandinho's and partially that's because of age but I don't see how we could look at a 70 million euro signing who was meant to be the heart of that midfield who I think has actually had a worse season than Gundogan um, 
and and not say that's disappointing. Yeah, but that's because Gundogan gets an absolute battering from City. He's he's Gundogan's City's a full quality guy. player. I, Gundogan is a quality. player. I mean, there's few. There's there's yeah, not very many players who have the match intelligence of, of Ilki Gundogan out there. I think I think Rodri's maybe underwhelmed in like patches, uh, but he's also had to play centre half, hasn't he? Like he might uh, as well uh, as other players that we've mentioned be a victim of, of a, a system that's you know and not an optimal system let's say but i think i mean still a very very good passer like you said his defensive contribution no not as good as fernandinho's last season but there's enough there to suggest that he can improve and he can be the player that we have those high expectations of where i'd say Jorginho's days are probably numbered uh, at, at chelsea um i don't I, I don't see frank sort of reverting to this 4-3-3 where everything comes through Jorginho and he will likely be sold um, and it's not a very good swan song for him this season is it Jorginho and there's players like Mbamin as well obviously signed for about 30 million pounds not barely God, feel sorry for barely him, played a minute because he's just had you know one horrific injury after another uh, that are probably worth a shout out Dennis Pratt is underwhelmed as well at, at Leicester it's got to be said um, but I'd say decent case for Rodri but that'd feel really harsh for me but I think, uh, but I don't really understand the argument that like Jorginho, like we expect Rodri to come good and therefore it's not disappointing. Like I think like that's not really relevant. Like it, it comes down to what how you've performed relative to how it was expected you'd perform. Yeah. And I think, um, I, I actually think Chelsea fans probably went into the season with Jorginho with quite low expectations. I think people were pleasantly surprised when they thought he'd been good in the autumn because last season Chelsea fans seemed to hate the guy. Whereas Rodri... We hyped him up, everyone hyped him up. And and like I say, I do think he'll come good. I think everyone agrees that he'll come good, but there's no way to look at Fana to look at Rodri's season and not say it's disappointing, I think. Like it's it's been quite a poor campaign. Well, I think Jorginho like when when Chelsea fans made him the fall guy, I think I think that was very harsh. Uh, and obviously he he got a bit of a battering because he was Sarri's golden boy, right? But I think he was performing at a much better level than people gave him credit for, particularly defensively uh, in that 4-3-3 system. Like even coming into, you know, the first 10, 15 games of this season, I remember his, his sort of numbers being parallel with um, sort of Rodri, Fernandinho, Fabinho. And then since like the two or three changes in system, he is just bottomed out completely and, and now looks like an objectively bad player on the pitch for me personally like where he looks lost in that system but but i don't think that necessarily relates to him being disappointing like like for instance he still makes more defensive actions than than rodri does like i mean i i see what you mean as in like we felt he was underrated last season we expected more of him and therefore he's had another bad season but I don't know. I, I guess I just think that like this was a guy who got pelters last year. He's getting them again this year. Actually, he's probably getting. He's probably been less badly treated this year than he was last year. Whereas Rodri last year was like the toast of Europe, and this year he's like, oh yeah, that guy who also plays in midfield for Man City and has not been very good. Um, but I don't know. I guess I just wouldn't. I, I'm not a fan of this particular kind of player. Like I think Ruben Neves. Ruben Neves has had a disappointing season. Um, very disappointing his numbers are down in pretty much every regard his defensive numbers are way down um, his goal and assist numbers I mean partially because he always shoots from outside the box like those are going to be very variable but he's not had a good season like mm. and I think actually I think Wolves have been good overall but um, but Jota had a disappointing first half of the campaign and Neves he's one of those guys that because people like him as a player they don't want to say he's had a disappointing season but this is somebody people are talking about as one of the best young midfielders in the league and i just i i truly don't see it like uh, he he's he's a mediocre defender and he's a good passer um he'd probably be better at a better side but that applies to a lot of guys in the league so i don't know in a way nevers has had the kind of poor man's rodri season um and i've not been particularly i'd put both of them in over undombele and certainly over baman who i do feel a bit sorry for because his legs just don't work why don't we let why don't we let the the commenters des decide who they'd have in the midfield why don't you pick your midfield free from the players that we've just mentioned so let's uh <laughs> let, let's move yeah. on to the forward line um Nic nicola yeah. Pe what so the three in midfield goes Jorginho, undombele rodri right um 
Ah, uh, I'm too sat on the fence of it. That's I'm a compromise. Of it. I mean, like, like I do think Pratt probably deserves a shout as well. Like, I hated that move when it happened. I didn't want Arsenal to sign him. Then Leicester said we'll have him, and I was like, I absolutely hate this move. I, I this guy isn't good at anything. I, I feel like Leicester made that move because Arsenal, Arsenal were interested. That, that's my beef with that move. <laughs> I feel like Ozil's had the most disappointing season of all. Oh of them. yeah, I forgot about Ozil. Um, I'd put Ozil in okay. over Undombele actually. I think. Sure. Well, should we sound. move on to the forward line and we'll we'll let the commenters just just dis describe decide the midfield. Um, all right, let's start out wide. Do we think Nicolas Pepe should be in here? He's not been a disaster by any stretch of the imagination. I think 15 goal contributions in 30 odd games is, is a fairly strong return, to be honest with you, for a first season in the Prem. But will we expect him more, Pat? Uh, mm, I think, yes, people were expecting more. Uh, I'm not that surprised. I think we substantially overpaid for him. Um, but even if we paid 40, 45 for him, which probably is what we should have paid, I still think it'll be a little bit disappointing. Um, he still dribbles down blind alleys a lot. On the other hand, the side is just worse across the board. I mean, like... When you look at like creative numbers uh, in the squad, even in like Wenger's last season, which was terrible, and then compare them to this season, like they're awful across the board. And I think that we assume that there's more to come there, but I think it has been. Ugh. The only thing I think that would keep him out of this is the fact that there are some attacking players in the league who have had truly, truly calamitous campaigns. Um, yeah, I agree. But he's certainly got to be in the conversation. I wouldn't really object if he went in. But I guess I he's at about 0.5 expected goals and assists per 90. That's kind of fine. 20 starts and 11 goal involvements in the league. Like, his dribble numbers are absolutely obscene. Like, I, I don't know. It's not bad, but pff, 72 mil. Like, But again, not, not his fault that Arsenal overpaid for him. Yeah, I think come back to Nicolas Pepe next season. If he doesn't step it up next season, if those numbers kind of maintain or fall, then you could be looking at yeah. a, a disappointment. But I agree with Pat Hampstead. There's some other candidates that have had some whiffers. No, I think that's a, a fair assumption for uh, for Nicolas Pepe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've clearly got an agenda, as you can tell on my Twitter timeline, against Ayosi Perez. And it's, it's starting to get a little bit out of hand. It's starting to get a little bit unhealthy. And it's predominantly because he's just not good enough for a side chasing Champions League football. Um, and he's a mu he's much better as a second striker working off a target man where the system is is very clearly defined and he can utilize his pace you know getting beyond uh, defenses who have stepped out like <sighs> Brendan Rodgers is currently asking him to play on the right hand side he's currently asking asking him to play at 10 um, and he can't work off Jamie Vardy because Jamie Vardy is not very good at coming short uh, like his his crossing on occasion can be very good, but his general hold up play and his, and his passing is not what he's renowned for. That's not what he wants to do. So it's kind of a waste of, of his skill set. And Iosi Perez is just, is just drifting in and out of games, um, not making any sort of telling contributions. You take that, take the, the hat trick against Southampton out of the equation and his, his numbers are, are very bare. I mean, that, that sounds harsh. Let's just arbitrarily take a hat trick from him. Um, but everything did fly in that day, didn't it? Expected, uh, expected goals-wise. Um, so so the Leicester boys had a field day then. So, so yeah, I just... For, for near on £30 million, I think it was, uh, that they paid for him. It's it, He's just... I just I just fail to see how he lives up to that that price range and how he even you know improves. There's been there's been no signs he can play he can be the player that Brennan Rodgers wants him to be and and on occasion it's led to the benching of Harvey Barnes, which I mean he he can be pretty erratic, but I think that's unforgivable on occasion um, because he was progressing nicely. Uh, at one point in the season, wasn't it? Um, so yeah, I would definitely put Iosi Perez on the right over Nicolas Pepe. Um, but you you liked this move last summer, and looking and looking at it now, like no, I, I think you do, you definitely defended this move last summer, and like he's, I th I don't think it's been that bad. He's got the same number of goal involvements as Pepe, and he cost less than half as much. Like I think I think this is a pure Rogers like because like mm. Perez has. He, su he paid too much for a mediocre player. Yeah, like Perez is fine at a mid-table club. 
um, and we perhaps didn't expect Leicester to, to be going to be gunning for Champions League football. I can't recall liking the move. I may have I may have just said it was acceptable. Um, Leicester were struggling with their recruitment late on in the in the window, and if Iosi if it was Iosi Perez or nothing, um, yeah, take Iosi Perez uh, because that forward line in the absence of Jamie Vardy is barely even Europa League, is it? Um, and Kalechi Inacho was was the forgotten man at that point, and he's and he's and he's still getting hauled off at half time for no you know no apparent reason. Um, so yeah, uh, I've got. Go on, sorry. Carry no, on. go on. I, I just think Iosi Perez for me on the right hand side. Um, the the club has probably outgrown players like Iosi Perez, um, and I do think the grief that even I give him, that Leicester fans give him, is probably disproportionate, given that you know he would be fine at a club that was looking to finish. 10th uh, and, he, and, he, and he probably you know probably knows that yeah I've got I mean I've got two candidates that I think stand good chances here um, the first one is Pablo Fernals. Um I think we forget that he cost nearly 25 million pound uh, to West Ham and I just think he's had a horrendous season I don't think it's been helped obviously by the shifting of the management to David Moyes uh, it's not going to suit him but I think we're expecting a heck of a lot more than the output he's delivered, which I think is two goals, five assists. Um, mm. And I'm sure West Ham fans were expecting more of him than that. But there's a lot of players in this West Ham squad, I think one of which we'll come on to in, in just a bit, in Seb Allaire, potentially also a candidate for most disappointing team. I just think we, and me certainly, I thought Pablo Fernandes was going to be better than he is. When I watch him, I just look at him and think, are you a Premier League standard player? I'm not overly convinced. Uh, like, I'm just not not a big fan of his. Um, Alex Awobi as well, I think, it was a big overpayment now when you look back on it at Everton, £35 million. I know that he, he's got some facets of his game that are p pretty strong, uh, but I don't think he'll be favoured by Carlo Ancelotti. And at £35 million, he's put up one goal, no assists, I think, this season. Mm. It's undeniably disappointing. I do think there's something to be said here, though, for both of those players in that um, they've ended up playing in systems which don't really have a natural home for them. Like, after Ancelotti mm. came in, he ended up kind of doing this lopsided 4-4-2, really. Um, yeah. And I think there's not a natural home in there for Iwobi, who is not... He's not a central midfielder, obviously. He's not a striker. And he's not really mobile enough to be a winger. He kind of needs to play in a 4-2-3-1, right? And I think mm. for Nows as well, probably needs to have a freer role in a midfield three or play as a number 10. And again, you know, when, when, when teams are struggling against relegation, you often see managers come in and say, we're going to go like extremely traditional kind of 4-4-2. Mm. And I think that tends to, tends to not benefit those guys who are not quite they're not defensive enough to be central midfielders they're not mobile enough to be full wingers but yeah I mean I definitely agree that they both had disappointing campaigns but I also watch Everton and I think they're playing Gilfie Sigurdsson and Tom Davis as a midfield too like I'm not sure that this is what Carlo envisages like long term as as his kind of uh, as his Everton setup what about the um, lad Gineppo that Southampton signed? He was, I think, their mm. record ever signing. Gineppo, and I think he's played less than a thousand minutes uh, in the I, league this season. I don't know if Hassan he's Hattel. injured because he he actually yeah, had a promising start and he had some decent cameos. Um, mm. And obviously, Hassan Hurst, yeah, system isn't like isn't the easiest, I guess, to adjust to or you know to enact as a, as a new player. Like it might just be that he has to go through that bedding in process. Um, that you know most of Southampton squad ha had to in, the, in, in six months because he is a very demanding manager, isn't he? And his forwards do an awful lot of pressing, and and at the minute, like um, you're not going to displace anyone in that forward line, like Armstrong, um, Danny Ings, who's the player on the left? I'm forgetting about that. I tweeted, tweeted about Redmond. Nathan Redmond. Yeah, Nathan Redmond. Like, I mean, he's not been as, anywhere near as dangerous as the season before, but he's looked like a much more complete player, and just. I just think it's hard getting in that forward line at the moment. There's a lot of like Villa players, isn't there? They, that fodder they signed with that 100 mil going forward, isn't it? But I kind of just struggled to pick one name out <laughs> of that side, to be honest with you, that's been a disappointment. I feel like they all have. What about Felipe Anderson as another candidate on the wing? Just been a victim of David Moyesism, do you think? Or, or has actually had a disappointing season here? I'd probably expect more of him. 
even in that David Moyes system than for now. He's a more like he has actually played as a wing back. He's played as a winger. Mm -hmm. You would expect him to to contribute more. Um, but again, like I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't watched enough West Ham to get a real sense of them. West Ham are just all over the shop. Mm. Yeah, right. Let's so we go to the central striker then, the, the number nine. So who are we agreeing because... on the wings then? I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely getting Perez in there, lads. I mean, I'm, oh, I think that's really harsh, but like, we could all pick one each. Go on. Um, I think, yeah, I think Pablo for now's just expected more. Uh, ooh, do I go for Ryan Fraser or do I go for Che Adams? Uh, hmm. I'll probably go for Che Adams because this was a dead season anyway for Ryan Fraser, but I kind of am delighted that he's been a real dick and, and has got ideas above his station and has had an absolutely horrible season where he's alienated everyone around him. Like, I, d I think that's really funny. What I will say about Perez before we move on, though, is when James Madison isn't in that forward line, everyone at Leicester looks like his significantly worse player. And I think they use him to play around, don't they? Like, Tielemann stays tight to him. Perez stays tight to him and without him that, that whole forward line looks a little bit lost which would suggest that you know Rogers actually can do a bit more from a management perspective um, but yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still going to go for Perez so we've got Perez I'm writing it all down Perez and Adams and, and Perez. go with Perez and Adams and we'll leave Pablo for now so then. No, Perez go with and, those two as Perez the and weapon. Fraser put Fraser in Perez and Fraser okay oh, yeah okay. why not Fraser. I've changed Fraser. my mind uh, uh, right, we need a point man then, and um, I think there's two outstanding candidates here between Joe Linton and Seb Allaire for me. Hmm. Seb Allaire did at least have one stretch of the season where he was good. Uh, Joe, Lint jo Joe Linton, 40 but, mil. But I also Fuck. look at Seb Allaire's Allaire, Seb um, kind of um, production line. Like I look at the guys he has supplying the ball to him. And I think, yeah, Joel Linton is basically like running around with nobody to help him out. Like Alan Sam Maximan has looked good in that team because he kind of thrives in that sort of side where they just give him the ball and hope he'll beat a bunch of guys. But their numbers are actually pretty damn similar. Like, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to really defend Joel Linton. Well, I suppose I am in the sense that I think that Newcastle are absolutely atrocious. Um, I'm amazed they've spent the whole season clear <laughs> of the relegation zone. Uh, they've been dreadful all season Go on, Brucey. And, um, yeah, I think... It, I, I'm not sure anyone's really been great there. But... Pff, he's but got fewer Joe goals. Linton, Joe Linton at 40 mil, man. Yeah, it's like... a lot. It's a lot. But it, on the plus side, at least they'll be able to get money back for him. Like, he's 23. Um... Mm. Like they'll get another stock season. Stock has taken such a big hit, though, man. I think it depends who would come in, though. Like, if they were to let Bruce go at some point and get a different manager in, I could see Joel Linton being quite a useful player for them. Um, same with Seb Haller, to be honest. Like, I think all these strikers, like, I can see them rebounding. I can see Seb Haller. I was just about to say rebounding more so than, than Joel Linton. Um, obviously, he's got some more expansive players around him, a, a better service, and and. Christ, I mean, even Moyes' West Ham are, are more competent in the final third than, than Bruce's Newcastle, uh, who are just relying on Alan St. Maximan, aren't they? Just just doing everything. Um, but at least Seb Allah's having more more than a couple of shots. Like, Jolin is averaging under two shots. His expected goals and assists is like 0.3, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah. like, but he's then only Max played one but... season of professional football before this, and he got about six goals. No, he also so played, no, he hasn't played one season. Like he played, he he's only got one season in the top five leagues. Before that, he was in I yeah. think, the Austrian Bundesliga. So like yeah, so he has so one season of top five football. Really. Yeah, if it just sure. just if we had to pick between the two, like I, I'm probably backing Seb Alla to come good more so than Joel Linton, but that's not necessarily necessarily you know Joel Linton's fault. Well, also, Joe Linton now is not playing as a central striker, is he? Like, it looks like he's playing a slightly different position and they've looked better since they've got Dwight Gale in the side, mm. um, who, who has always been an underrated finisher, I think. But, yeah. Um, but I don't know, like, we we say, oh, Joe Linton's had an appalling season and Sam Maximan's had a great season, but Joe Linton and Sam Maximan, Joe Linton's at, like, 0.3 expected goals and assists per 90. Sam Maximan's at 0.38. Mm. Like, Almiron is between the two of them at 0.33 and those are the top three in the Newcastle squad. Like, it is rank. Um, I've I've got one more suggestion. Go on. What about Moise Kane? Because... Uh, is it his like, fault? just think that's harsh, yeah. I, 
His numbers have I been mean, fine. I mean, and DCL has been amazing. And so has Richarlison. They both, you know, like, do you drop either one of those guys right now? And I'm not sure that's about Ken. I think that's about those I, two. I don't. But equally, under three different managers, he's not had a sniff now. Well, under two managers. Let's not go overboard. Yeah, maybe I'm being harsh with Big Dunk, but <laughs> the, obviously he was bought on for a minute, wasn't he? And then taken off again. But yeah, but that was just uh, surely we managed. But that we expected one of... way more than, than this for 28 million euros. Yeah, but again, I think they bought him for the future, didn't they? Like, he's so young. Yeah, I mean, and you add, yeah. you add up all those sort of uh, minutes, you know, here and there, and they actually amount to, to pretty decent per 90 numbers. And that's not to give him an easy way out. But but again, that I think that does show he's got m more to give. You know, three shots, almost a key pass, over two and a half dribbles. Yeah. Um, like he, he's, he's only scored one goal forever. Yeah, and he's got a couple of assists as well. But I, I just think like he's not really had the ample opportunity to, to show he, you know what he can do. Whereas Joel Linton and Seb Allah have eaten up an awful lot of minutes, haven't they? Yeah. Okay. So, but, but in much my, worse sides, my yeah. vote is Joel Linton then. I think I'd agree. I think that's fair. Okay, so so that was our eleven. Can you recap it, Hamel? I've already forgotten. I can. Kepper in goal, Cancelo right back, Mings and Diop centre halves, Vertonghen at left back. We've got a pretty tasty midfield three of Jorginho, Jorginho, and Bele and Rodri, and then Perez, Joel Linton, and Fraser up top. Still, Özil has to get in that team, man. It's unreal that we're we just not playing a ten there, though, are we? So. Yeah, neither were Arsenal, but he's still the most disappointing player. Uh, with, the with special mentions for Ozil and Jordan Pickford there. Right, okay, so one quick fire question, one personal question. The quick fire one from Kawal. He says, manager of the season in Europe, including the Premier League. Uh I think if it weren't for if it weren't for Liverpool having an historic season, I, I think it would have to be Chris Wilder. So I'm gonna say Chris Wilder. I think he deserves it. Like that squad. We were totally right last summer when we said it was like a championship quality squad it is a championship quality squad there's the odd player who's decent in it but it's a championship quality squad yeah and they're gonna finish comfortably in the top half and they deserve it like i mean i, I it, it's remarkable what he's done i i'm i'm so impressed by it i'm delighted for him yeah i probably would say chris wilder um i'm trying to think of some other other shouts maybe zinedine zidane you know he's i think zinedine zidane has had one of his best seasons uh in management despite the fact he'd won three uh, before that, what about Gasparini? Maybe yeah. at Atlanta, Gasparini, Conte as well. I mean, like Atlanta are finishing I mean, the season really, really strongly, uh, and of course, I think have a very good chance against PSG. Despite you know people thinking that Mbappe and Neymar are going to decimate them, um, I don't think that's going to happen by any means. But and obviously Jurgen Klopp, there's no doubt about Jurgen Klopp being in there. Um, I guess it would probably be Jurgen Klopp, but we're just kind of like bored about talking about how good Liverpool have been, right? Um, this season uh right let's do one personal question then uh <laughs> who would win in a fight jamie oliver or peter andre that's the most ridiculous <laughs> question from bay of the week 17 oh, christ um jamie oliver would would definitely beat peter andre a, to a with, pulp with a yeah because he could use French instruments stick. like he could use knives and forks what, and stuff is that What's the rule is you get to bring like whatever tools you can with you from your respective profession so like andre gets to bring yeah. like a surf andre's bringing wax or, or you know, hit him with like yeah. a casio or jordan keyboard. <laughs> and knock his teeth out i mean is peter andre still hench he is quite hench actually because jamie oliver is super not yeah he's quite yeah. tubsy bit oliver, do isn't bit doughy yeah. isn't he? he is a bit doughy. He, I, um, I think jamie oliver is, is soft as <laughs> I, re I reckon Peter Andre fills him in. Peter Andre rips out one of his fake abdominal muscles and beats Jamie Oliver to death with and it. And then uses his body oh as a surfboard Christ. in an updated video of Mysterious Girl. What is going on? Right, I think we should end the show there, to be honest with you, because it's descended into ridiculousness. Yeah. Um, should we plug the podcast channel? Because there's loads of subscribers going on over there in their patter. Yeah, head over to the Football Daily Podcast and check out the podcast channel. Uh, we've obviously got some updates. There's a new podcast with me and Doogie that will be out uh, right now, which is very exciting times, where we talked about some interesting off cuts from the bigger sides around Europe and where they could potentially go this summer, including players to Atletico Madrid and Arsenal. Um, but yeah subscribe to that and make sure you subscribe to it on whichever podcast app you use as well we really appreciate it 
There we go. And if it's plug hamster. No, that's it. My phone's about to die. Goodbye. All right. See you later. Bye 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 bye. bye. bye.